New College Law School in San Francisco, a public interest law school. And uh, I've also taught at University of Minnesota, Bolt Hall, City University of New York, public interest law school. I teach contracts and uh, law and social change, the politics of law, and other courses. I went to Harvard Law School, graduated in 1972, and uh, I have a PhD in psychology from the Wright Institute in Berkeley. I'm associate editor of Tikkun Magazine, and then you, probably the, the primary organizer with Nanette Shore of the project for integrating spirituality, law, and politics, otherwise known as Pi Slap. And I guess I would add to that I'm an organizer of the network of spiritual progressives, and I lead the law task force of the network of spiritual progressives, organizing with the project for integrating spirituality, law, and politics, overlapping with that organizing law teachers, lawyers, and law students uh, in um, trying to create a new kind of legal culture emphasizing empathy, compassion, and mutual understanding rather than adversarial self-interest and rights-based argument. I came to this project uh, primarily through the social movements of the 1960s. So a major foundation of the social movements of the 60s was an awareness that the Vietnam War and um, uh, many other manifestations of human suffering in, in our culture was the result of a legacy of alienation from self and from the other that produced a kind of collective insanity in which people um, uh, were disconnected from their authentic humanity and, and trapped in a series in a a kind of hardened, alienated way of being that uh, was coupled with, in a way, pathological social fantasies about other human beings, demonization of others, uh, anxious aggrandizement of self. These are all psychological categories, but they were a key part of the, the transformation of consciousness that was the 1960s. And in the 1960s, this in very importantly took the form of a social and political movement rather than a movement just about individual psychology and was a kind of collective awareness that in part people came to through uh, the experience of activism, through the experience of having the confidence to come out of hiding, engage with others, and challenge what seemed to be the fixed character of the existing society in a belief that it could be transformed. But the way of thinking within which we understood the world at that time, the way of thinking of being able to criticize the whole world rather than just each individual human interaction was tended to be Marxism and uh, a, social, a form of social thought that focused on the economic system, the injustices of the economic system, the individualism that we thought at that time was generated by the economic system itself as the foundation. And um, so I would say anger was the dominant, uh, at least public way of manifesting ourselves. And uh, the analysis of economic processes and economic injustices shaped our way of thinking about the world tremendously. And for those of us that came, became lawyers and law professors in that time, it also shaped our way of thinking about law. Because we saw a law as an arena of struggle in which Poor people and people who had been the objects of injustice would engage in a kind of battle with the ruling class and with dominating groups to seek to make gains uh, gradually in the service of transforming this whole unjust totality. There was a lot that was true about that and a lot that was very valuable about it. But there was also a disconnect because the, uh, the critique of collective alienation that I started out with and the discovery of authentic human community that was a key part of the 60s was sort of lost in the analysis of antagonism, struggle, and battle. That was an important part of the way of thinking that came out of the, the left tradition in politics. And if you think we then all went through a process, uh, it, however much we've talked about it, of dealing with uh, dynamics within the movement itself that were destructive, 
that undermine the movement from within, and of watching and participating in the collapse of the Soviet Union, the problems in that have come that have been linked in part to the Marxist tradition of the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia, of the Chinese Cultural Revolution, of multiple manifestations of the kind of radicalism that was linked to the traditional paradigm that we kind of, through a long, partly conscious, partly unconscious process, I think have come to see many of us as involving more profoundly a spiritual alienation from other human beings and from ourselves than something we could externalize onto the economic system as the culprit. And this long process, which actually always was part of what made us become political in many, it wasn't like this hadn't occurred to us, but it took a long time to connect these dots that I'm describing. Um, out of this long process came a different kind of critique that emphasized how were we going to create forms of community and understanding and mutual recognition that could give people the confidence to let go of the individualism and social separation that's pervasive elsewhere in the culture. It was, had to come from something else besides the kind of political models that we were working with. And in law and legal culture, this, um, this led to another way of thinking about social transformation and law. Um, and the way I would put it is, uh, in, in my own case, I came to see law as a kind of uh, uh, very important set of social institutions that uh, encoded and supported the separation of self and other rather than the connection of self and other. And um, I, I came to see this at many different levels uh, as a teacher and activist. Uh, for example, I teach contract law. And uh, I, I, I perceive contract law as being, as teaching each new generation of lawyers that it is natural for people to operate as separated individuals pursuing their own self-interest in the world in order to maximize uh, the benefits of bargains that they make in their own self-interest. And that's hidden or buried in all the rules. So it's possible to become completely immersed in law school in the technicalities of distinguishing one case from another or in the refinements of each area of doctrine um, without realizing that it's occurring within a set of assumptions that as a whole is conveying to students that the world is the way it is because free and equal human beings voluntarily choosing to pursue their own self-interest create it to be that way and therefore it's good, it must be good because it embodies those choices that each separated individual actor is seeking for him or herself. And actually, this is a very narrow view of the world. And I didn't, it took me a while to learn that this is what I was actually teaching people uh, as I made my way through the, the doctrines. And this, in turn, and in part this occurred through my own participation in the critical legal studies movement and in developing a legal scholarship that critiqued these doctrines by working together and supporting each other and holding conferences and summer camps and reading and teaching each other, we could come to see or learn the mod this, this criticism of individualism and social separation in contracts, let's say, or in, um, in other areas of doctrine. The Constitution, which is uh, everyone in this room is taught, and is uh, as, as valuable and important a document as that is, and as much as that document is the result of hundreds of years of struggle, to validate the individual and protect the individual from group tyranny and group coercion. Incredibly important. We can recognize it as a, a very valuable accomplishment in human history. Uh, it still says nothing about connecting the individual to other human beings. There's nothing in the Constitution about love, about community, about mutual affirmation, about social connection. 